go here to hopkins.science.190.com and um, register to present. We'd love for you to present, love new ideas. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And now it's my pleasure to introduce to you a good, good, good friend of mine who um, I met 20 years ago in business who's been a mentor to me, Sharon Smith of Hormone Cosmetics. this red lipstick is on correctly because I went to a seminar one time and uh, one of the things that was said to me was uh, or said to us was uh, always have on your red lipstick if you're going to get on a speech because of the fact that people will pay more attention to you. Now what you guys are supposed to do I really don't know but I've got red <laughs> lipstick so anyway uh, I just want to say thank you for letting me be here today. I am Sharon Smith. I own the Royal Norman Cosmetic Studio. I have been in business 20 years as of May the 6th. After four years, I was ready to quit and go home. Uh, I was paying for my business, but I wasn't paying me. So anyway, what happened then was that I started networking with other business owners. That's the reason why I'm here today to talk here and is to let you know that 16 years ago, I could have gone home had it not been for the fact that I've listened and started networking with other small business owners. So anyway, uh, when I agreed to do this, oh, there I am. <laughs> uh, when I agreed to do this, uh, I should have worn that out there. Uh, when I agreed to do this, uh, I thought everybody knows my business. Well, how vain is that? Everybody does not know my business. Um, and so I thought, you know, your business is still growing. You're still in business. You still need to be presenting to people and telling them what you do, what your business is. And so that's the reason why I said, hey, let me do it, because I don't have any problem talking about my business. And then the other thing is, I've got a few points to make to entrepreneurs that are here, people that are wanting to be in business, people that are in business, and just a few things that have happened to me over the years that I feel like is worth sharing. And then I'm open to any question that you have. Um, believe me, I'm not shy about talking or answering questions. So, um, but I'm going to give you a little bit of my background. First of all, Graduated high school in 1966. Went to work in the banking industry, which many of you all are in today. Stayed there till I realized that really and truly for me, that wasn't the right fit. Went to work for the telephone company, worked for them for 12 years. Decided that I had made the love of my life and I wanted to come back to Madisonville to live with him in 1983 and uh, gave up a Good paying job in 1983, if you were making $30,000 a year, you were making good money. You know, and I was making good money. And, but anyway, but I felt like Larry was worth a lot more than that. Came back here. He said, Work if you want to or not. Boy, what an opportunity was that. So I didn't work for about a year, and then I got really, really bored. And Mark and I talked about that earlier, and so I went to work for GE. Actually, went to work out there as a Kelly girl which was a temporary position. But after I got out there, and the reason I went there was because I was looking for a full-time job with a great company, good benefits, all the things that everybody looks for. And uh, after about nine months, they hired me on full-time. I worked for them for seven years, and I had three different positions there. And every position that I took, they did away with. Guess what? <laughs> you know, it went to Cincinnati. And we're not going to fill that job, or we're going to do this, or we're going to do that. So anyway, finally, the last time that happened to me, they said we'll give you a job out on the plant floor. Well, I'm not too good to work in a factory and on the plant floor. And those people work hard. They make good money. They are good, hardworking people. But it wasn't what I wanted to do. And thankfully, I did not have to do that. So GE gave me the money. So what did I do? I went back to school, went to college. 
But in the meantime, even when I was working at GE, there was a business that I really, really loved, and it was the Merle Morton business. I, well, I say the business I loved, it was the product that I loved. So I was walking down the hall at uh, Parkway Plaza Mall, and uh, I was with my daughter and with her stepmom. Believe it or not, we're friends. You know, it's been a long time, we're friends. And we were talking about what kind of business we would like to do or be in. And I said, well, that's the business I think I would like to do. And it was the Merle Mormon business. So we walked in there, and I asked Beth McIntosh, who was the owner at the time, I said, how do you get to be a Merle Mormon studio owner? And she said, where do you want it? And I said, well, obviously, I'd like to be here because this is where I live, but you have it. She said, well, you can always sell it to you. You know, so anyway. And so we talked, and, uh, but I still had my job at GE. I was smart enough that I went to an accountant, I went to an attorney, I went to the Small Business Development Center through Murray, you know, checking out that business, and found and everybody that I talked to said, don't pay her that much money, she's asking way too much money for that business. So then whenever I did make her an offer, it insulted her, and it was two years later that I was finally able to buy that business, but on my charm. You have to be diligent and do your due diligence before you jump into a business. And then the other thing is, I didn't have any money. <laughs> you know how many, how many people have heard that before? I had $10,000. And so anyway, uh, I went to the bank. And I'm not wanting to offend any bankers that are here, but you know, uh, the one that actually made me that first loan is in this bank. Is in this meeting today, sitting here listening to me 20 years later. He trusted me. He thought I was, I was, uh, I was going to be good at it, and he loaned me the money. But I said, oh, you know, you want my firstborn child, right? And that was pretty much it. That's how I got into business. Thank you very much. We're going to let people open up for ask you questions. Somebody did make questions for me. Decide what part you to add. And what would you not add again? <laughs> you want to ask me about taking out? <laughs> uh, well, uh, the reason I added pro more product lines was because I wanted to make more money. I mean, that's just plain and simple. I had a customer. The customers were walking in the door. I only had one product line to sell to them. And so, therefore, that the way, the only way I was going to make more money and grow my business was to sell more cosmetics, and which we do, and I'm going to brag, and if you get offended by that, well, I'm so sorry, but I'm going to brag. I mean, our business has grown many, many, many times over the last 20 years. And just like other retail businesses, we've gone up, we've gone down, we've gone up, we've gone down. But finally, I've gotten to the point to where we can weather the storm because we're high enough up now that we can take a hit every once in a while and weather the storm. But uh, I added other product lines because I felt like there were needs in the community for these product lines that I was going to bring in. And I looked for things that were more unique to this community so that people, it's kind of like Jenny in a coffee shop. You know, I mean, we, I want something that you're not going to find in every store in Madisonville. And I wanted something that I felt like would appeal to the customer base that I already had. And that's the reason why I brought those in. Now, again, looking at it from the business standpoint, I'm getting ready to take several of those product lines out because I have two product lines that provide 90% of my business and the other 10% are dragging me down. So they're leaving, you know. It's about change, you know, and knowing your business and knowing your market and always looking for that something that's more and better out there. Just comment more than question. You do a great job with keeping your staff um, knowledgeable about the product. I think that's one advantage that you all have over a lot of businesses. You go in, they know what they're talking about and you make everybody feel welcome when they're there and they don't make us feel like I've done things. Uh, and I had, you know, uh, I brought my baby swans in and now they're adult swans and they're using the product. So it's been able to be generational. 
Well, Mark Norman actually started in 1929 with her product line, and she had it ready and poised to sell to a big, huge cosmetic company. She was just going to sell her patent and her product and everything. Well, 1929, everybody knows that, you know, the country went belly up. So anyway, her deal fell through. So in 1931, in the midst of the Depression, or the beginning of the Depression, well, she decided to open her own business. We're still here. It's been almost 85 years. And the reason for that is because it is a great company, a great product, but the other thing is because of what Lisa said. We, our business is only as strong as the weakest employee. Just like a chain, you know, if your chain has a weak link in it, then everything can fall apart. And our business is all the same way. That's the reason why I spend my time and my money and I invest in my employees because they are my chain. And without them, I don't have a business. So anyway, so I have to have that weakest link as strong as it can be. And it may not be as strong as the one out here on the end or whatever, but it has to be a strong link. And so when you come into my studio, and I'm going to pick on some people that are that are friends and that I've known and they'll be kind to me. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I'm going to pick on Jane first. And Jane, I met Jane when I went into business. I, first thing I did was join the chamber. That was the first group I started doing, doing business with. Jane was head of the chamber at that time. And she became my customer. And she might have been a customer before, I'm not sure, but she became my customer. And she was there to help me and guide me along as a business owner. And the chamber did so many things for me, but I gave back to the chamber in turn. So, you know, it's like this and this and this and this. And we do the same thing for our customers. But Jane, tell them about your last experience when you came in and the pink. Oh. My last experience was I went in for a lipstick and I came out, I think I spent 120 bucks. <laughs> I came out with blush and, and lip liners and because, you know, you go in on a Saturday, you have no makeup on, you just want to get some lipstick and they start going, oh, but this would look really good. And then they start putting on you and you're like, well, darn, I did look pretty good. <laughs> so then you walk out with a big sack of stuff. And the great thing about it is they don't, they don't just try to sell you something to sell you something. They really want you to look good so or better. So when you go out in the community, you know, if somebody says something to you or says, I love that lipstick or that blush looks great, I know guys are going, you don't really talk like that. <laughs> but you can say, I got that wrong. And that's what they want. We're all walking billboards from our own. And that's why my employees have to know their stuff. Mm -hmm. Sharon, what uh, challenges do you see uh, or what goals do you have for the future in, in terms of reacting to the market or continuing to grow your business and, and change with confidence? Okay. That's good. If there's any one quote that you take home from here today of anything that I've got to say, it is, Begin with the end in mind. You know, I mean, when I went in business, I had not heard that saying. But when I did, but I held on to that. Begin with the end in mind, where you want to be. Because if you don't know where you want to be, then you're not going to know how to get there. If you don't know where you want to be, then you're not going to set goals along the way to make you get to that point. And so to answer your question the best that I can, uh, if you can't tell after 20 years, I'm still passionate about the Merle Norman cosmetic business. But I am ready to move on to be doing great things and spend time with that partner that I said is the love of my life and travel and do all this kind of stuff and everything. So my challenge right now, and as an established business and one that has, has grown, and now if somebody were to buy my business, they could lock in there and pay for that business and pay for themselves. 
not like I did when I started in the beginning. But the challenge right now is, you know what? It doesn't matter what the challenge is. If you want to succeed in your business, then you have to put the time and the effort. The challenge really isn't any different than it was to begin with. I just wish I knew now, I knew then what I know now, and who knows? I might not be here talking to you. I might be off on a trip around the world, but, anyway, <laughs> but I'm not. But we may get a little piece at a time when I retire. But, but the challenges with business, being a business, is, is always the challenge that you're going to have. You're going to have the challenge of finding the right employees for the right job. You're going to have the challenge of motivating those employees to do what you want them to do. You're going to have the challenge of whatever the economics of the world are. Because believe you me, whenever the price of gas goes up, my lipstick sales go down. You know, I mean, that's the same challenge that it is for every business. Now, goals for my business, I mean, we're still looking to be number one or number two in Rural Norman Cosmetics. And uh, the reason I brought Yes. Oscar, well, <laughs> Oscar with me today and the reason I borrowed money from Kevin is because I'm a competitive person. In the year 2000, Ronald Norman started putting out their number one and number two and up to number ten businesses in their company. They never did that before, but we shared our numbers and they asked you, you know, what kind of numbers are you doing and everything. And so guess what I missed out on being on stage. You know, it doesn't matter what the number is, but I missed out on being on stage by $800 that night. Oh, God. $800. And let me tell you, I started making my notes that day as I was watching those people up there and I came back and I told my staff, I want to be on stage. I didn't tell them I wanted to raise my sales. I said, I want to be on stage. That's where I wanted to go. So anyway, so the next year we were number two. The next year after that, we were number two. Finally, the problem with being number two is you don't get to talk. So we <laughs> <laughs> So number one gets to talk. So anyway, so I invited my staff to a staff meeting. And anyway, and I told them, and I'm going to pick on you, and you're going to get Barbara. I was going to call you Becky, but Barbara. I told them to shut their eyes. So shut your eyes, hold your hand up, and I'm going to put something in your hand. Can you tell what that is? Money. Money? <laughs> How much money? That I can't tell. Well, anyway, I went to the bank that day, wrote a check for $3,000, came back with a uh, $3,100 bills, put $500 in my staff's hand and told them that I wanted them to think about what that was and what that could do for them because it was theirs. And then I had them open up their hands, I had my Oscar, and I gave my acceptance speech. And I said, and that money is yours if I could go on stage and talk at the Women's Women's Convention and I would take my Oscar with me. I was number one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, we're still in the top two percent in the nation, in the nation, in rural Norman sales right now today. Now, are we number one or number two? We're not. We're number three. <coughs> but we're number three out of 600 studios that are in our demographic. And so, and that's over half of normal studios. So anyway, uh, we're in a small town of 17,000 people. There's lots. I can still do twice the business I'm doing today if I want to work hard enough at it. Uh, Tim. From a business owner standpoint, what do you know now that you wish you knew 20 years ago? Well, what I know now is the fact that uh, you do have to work on your business. You cannot be in your business all the time. And you have to go outside of your business in order to grow your business. Because it's just like customers having regular customers. I mean, we only market today same customers over time. They die out or they decide they have something 
better, they lose their job, they can't spend as much money. And so you have to be outside and you have to be active in the community is, is the one thing that I have learned. And the other thing I've learned is to be able to give up things that I'm not good at to somebody that's better at it than I am. That's the reason why Marion does most of my marketing. That's the reason why you see newsletters come from Merle Norman because Sharon didn't do that newsletter. She told her what she wanted in and Marion put it together for me and off she goes. You know? And uh, so anyway, uh, I don't do my own payroll anymore. I lease myself back to my own company. You know? I pay for that, but it frees me up to do other things that I want to do. But if you're not good at everything in your business, and believe you me, you still have to know about that. You can't just turn things over to somebody and say, here. I talked to somebody about that this week, and he told me he didn't even know how much money he made. He gave his, all this stuff over to his, his uh, accountant, and you know what I'm thinking? Yeah, right. It's his brother-in-law. And I'm thinking, mm -hmm, I wonder how rich he is. You know? <laughs> uh, it's not just not the trusting of that. You, know? you have to know your business. And the other thing is, uh, I'm going to leave. I'm going to tell you a quote that I heard, and I'm hoping that what Jane felt when she was this, and it is, and most of you guys are going to recognize this quote. It's not. I don't know. I may not know what you did. I may not know. Let's see. What you said. But I do know how you made me feel. And had that first banker that I had done business with had not made me feel that I could be successful in my business, probably wouldn't be here. You know, if he didn't have the trust and the faith in me whenever I started that I could do this, first, like I said, he was well covered. My husband was willing to put our house up against that business. And me, you know, and that's, that's a lot of trust to put into someone that's new in business and has never been a business person before. But, uh, you know, if we didn't make Jane feel good and she walked out the door and she came for an $18 lipstick and went out and spent $120, she would probably say, never going back there again. You know, because she had to feel good about it and our customers have to feel good about it. And how many people in this room have customers? Raise your hand. Yes. If you're in business, work for a business, you know, if you're a preacher, you've got a customer. And so the ones that are going to do business with you are the ones that you are going to feel good, that they want to do business with you. And the other thing is, in all of my advertising, if you ever hear me on the radio, it's, hi, this is Sharon Smith with Mormon Cosmetics. I do my own radio ads. You know, I don't let somebody else do them. My name is synonymous with Merle Norman in Madisonville, I think. You know, what is Merle Norman? Somebody give me an answer. What's Merle Norman? It's a, it's a cosmetic company. Who is Merle Norman in Madisonville? Sharon's men. You know, I mean, it's just, and, and so therefore, whenever my customers come to my store, then, they come because we have a great product. They come because they feel good when they leave. And they come because they know that they are going to be treated as if they are the only customer that we have at that particular time. And there are two types of customers. Somebody want to answer what that is? Happy not happy. For repeat shoppers and one-time shoppers. There's potential customers and in our customers. And everybody in this room is a potential customer for my business. I have men's products. <coughs> I'd be happy to sell you some the right products. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sharon. Great job. You know, oh. uh, we're <laughs> going to down here for everybody that's here. Men take them for your wife, your girlfriend, your your significant other, your daughter, or if you don't have one of those, take them to your assistant, your secretary. I want all of those to leave this room today. The 12-step program, if you want to put it that way.
Um, we're excited to have as our second presenter today, uh, I believe John Love is, uh, is going to do most of the speaking, but both John and his brother Jim Love are here today. They are the uh, guys who started, uh, they're, they're another uh, veteran uh, entrepreneur, entrepreneurial company, and um, uh, Profile Systems Design Group. With that, I'll turn it over to John. Thank you. Thank you. That was excellent. Thank you. Need my lipstick. I'll stick with blue. Uh, yeah, good for now. Fine. Profile Systems Design Group did not start as Profile Systems Design Group. It actually started as Profile Marketing and Research Group in uh, 1984, fall of, and actually business began in 85. I came up with a uh, idea that I presented my brother Jim, who's on the president of Jim's <coughs> vice president, uh, secretary, and treasurer of the company today. And uh, I said, we can do a market research company because the city of Hopkinsville did this big survey. I was a on-fire grad student and uh, had done market research. And I said, we can do this. We can make $40,000 marketing research money. So we said, yeah, let's do it, and took off. Uh, I had connections through the Chamber of Commerce in Madisonville, back to Murray State, and that worked. We did uh, business surveys for about a year and a half. I quit my job after about nine months or so, and actually began full-time work with Profile. Jim was still doing x-ray tech work and uh, working with me part-time. That lasted for a while. And um, then we became more of the computer side of the world and we figured out that we ought to take our own advice on market research and listen to what people are telling us. We want you to come do programming for us because the programs you develop for market research, we want to use for our businesses. That led to getting into computer sales. And along the way, we decided, well, market research really doesn't describe designing accounting systems for people, so we changed the name, and that's where we are today. We became incorporated at that time. And now our company, and I've been working on this to see how it falls, our company helps retail hardware store owners become cowboys that can hurt cats and find money trees in their stores. <laughs> now, hopefully that brings up a picture of trying to herd employees and, and customers into the store and then trying to figure out what products within the store and services you should be selling and those that you should be getting rid of. Because our software is a complete management software of a, of a store, specifically targeted towards hardware stores, do it best and true values are two specific hardware stores we've been actually certified with those corporations at the highest levels that they will obtain certification, which allows us to be a very limited market uh, as far as competitors because we've reduced our, uh, our, reduced our focus. So we're not doing every retail business under the sun because there are thousands of point of sale softwares. We've gotten it down to, we do retail hardware stores. <coughs> we have some exceptions and you always have exceptions in business. Um, just going through this. In the summer of 86, we began to sell uh, the marketing, and yeah, let's see, where am I down to? First point of sale system, we actually put in 350 sites across the country. We had a dealer network that we developed through an accounting package, and the problem began that we lost connection with those end users. The, uh, because you sell to a dealer and you're another dealer, they don't want you stealing their business, so people wouldn't reveal that. So problems we looked at. And we get increased staff at the time. We became Y2K, if you ever remember that. The world's going to come to an end. Change all your computers. So we changed computers in 1999 like crazy. We throw in computers. The thing that happened in 2000 was that we looked at it and we said, you know, if we've already upgraded every computer in the country, there are no computers to sell in 2001. 2000 because it's already been done. It's only got to be new installations, which at that time you could keep 
computer about two years. If everybody remembers. I don't see. Yeah, everybody was, was around then. And <laughs> you would want to buy a new one. So there's constant <coughs> upgrades. You're selling lots of hardware. So we saw that that was an opportunity. And as we came out of that, we were also got plenty of cash. And we made a determination that we were going to develop our own complete package. And we're not going to tie to the back end of another accounting package. So we spent, and I, well, I went off to a seminar and came back on news, and Jim said, well, how long do you think it'll take? And I said, oh, two, three, four months at most. <laughs> well, a year later, <laughs> John finally finished, and uh, Jim had been supporting the company through hardware sales and doing networking and such. And today, we're completely focused on this one product. We've increased staff. We sell nationally to 37 states across the country. Uh, we've got close to 1,000 users, end users on workstations uh, running the product, uh, close to 200 sites, and continue to see demand increasing. Uh, so that's where we are today. Now, the hard lessons. The first thing we probably came back with was when we began, we got to remember, we were the two guys who were son of physicians. Physicians do not sell assets. Physicians sell their time. You go do surgery, you go do an office call, they're going to bill you for X amount of time. That's my six minutes. I thought I was talking fast. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and hit these real quick, but learning to bill for your first services are truly worth and not discounting them until somebody says, ouch. Uh, selling assets, not time, is really a way to make money. You sell assets, Sharon. And that, you can sell one asset, that marker, that will take, I can sell one of these or a million of these, I'll make more money per minute than I will building my time out. That's why accountants and lawyers cost so much. <laughs> Gaining control of your product. You either need a franchise, going back to Sharon again, is it? She has that, or you have to own the product yourself. Otherwise, somebody can steal it from you. And we found the control of owning our own software that we had developed made a huge difference, which allows you also to control the pricing of the product. The other one is creating a revenue stream. Sharon has customers, and I use up my lipstick, I come back. In the software world, you own it, and we came up with a way to do recurring revenue through a maintenance plan that allowed people to stay up to date with their software on an ongoing basis, and they don't have to rebuy it every time. So they have a flat cost of ownership rather than I own it, now I gotta buy it again. And I own it, I gotta buy it again. So everybody likes it, it makes your cash flow much better. Uh, document the products itself on how to use them, but also document how you do your business. You're looking, going back to Sharon, and she says, what's the end game? The end game is how do you get rid of your business? If nobody understands how your business works and you haven't written it down, then it's all in your head. If you don't remember it, or then you have somebody else doing the, step, the things that you were doing, somebody's going to get missed by documenting it. Everybody knows what everybody's job is. Banks will make loans on physical assets, not software. We've gone over this before. I can, we had to build the factory before we could sell a single copy of it, that year worth of investment. And there's actually about 14 years now worth of man hours in building our product. Today, it's still being added onto. Growth is based upon selling and reinvesting those profits in our software products. So we continue to pour money back into it even today, and it's paying off as we sell more and more products. So I think that's that first hardware store that you came into, tell us how that happened. I understand that was a good sure. story. Uh, the first hardware store we came to was Workshop Shoe Value. Uh, Stiefel's owned it at that time. And they needed a, uh, a product, uh, inventory control software for the shop. We made a little program that worked well. About six or so months later, Roger came to us and he said, I want to make the whole thing point of sale. I want to automate the whole store because right now we're using the old crank box and the girls are having to go manually keep up with what account balances are. And 
So I was like, I'd gone through some bad experience with developing some software, and I decided we're going to buy something off the shelf that we can modify, make any changes to. And so I sat him down and gave him three packages, and he said, that one. I think my people will work with that, and we went through it. And I said, great, I'll get it. I ordered it, paid $1,000 for a demo, and uh, got the package in, and I'm looking at it. I said, well, we're gonna make some code changes to it, and look at subtle things, open up the code, and it's sort of like, okay, this is what I expect, this is what I got. <laughs> There was no code. <laughs> Paid a thousand bucks for it, went back to Roger, told him, hey, uh, there's no code. <laughs> They're having an argument with their programmer, the programmer's in a lawsuit, blah, blah, blah. It's not gonna happen, Roger. And he says, well, can you write it for me anyway? Had another programmer working with us, went back and I said, do you think we can write a point of sale package? <laughs> and he said, shoot, we're good. We can do it. So in three months, we came up with an initial package. Uh, anybody know Tony Harris was retired forever? Well, Tony broke it in 30 seconds. He brought it in and tested it, and Tony goes, click, click, and he goes, Pow. So that was our start, and then uh, things got better very quickly after that. Is that the one we're talking about? Yeah. What made you decide to only do hardware stores? Oh, <clears throat> great question. Why do hardware stores? Because hardware store people know where the screwdriver is, and if they need an extra surge strip, they go to the shelf. And truly, that is part of why. At least when you talk to personalities, I don't have to. I felt that. We both felt that you could go across the country and you could send stuff to people and they would be able to assemble it and feel comfortable with when you tell them, okay, you need to run a wire from here to there. And they go, well, yeah. And that's just an experience thing. Though that tends to be a group of people. The other side was, was that in order to make our product unique, we needed an edge. And the biggest thing with inventory control in any store is you have to get the inventory in the computer. The original one that was done at Roger Stiefel's place, they spent literally a month with three people putting inventory items in every single one, hand key. We're talking about 20,000 items, putting the pricing and descriptions in and categorizations and all that. What the hardware industry had was value specifically, we were aware that they had the electronic interface for the catalogs, for ordering, for downloading inventory, for adding new items, already present, and they'd already thought about that. So, as we looked across, because we, with those 350 initial installs, which were a totally different product, we were in and everything from jewelry stores, to concrete companies, to hardware stores, to bait shops, and just and the thing that came back as a common issue was how to get the inventory. This also allowed us, because those har uh, hardware co-ops, specifically True Value, in order for them to say, you're a good software, you had to go through a cer certification process. There were only two products that they would represent. And then there was a tier underneath of it they called Gold. And we had to qualify to get that gold. Well, today we're one of one company that's gold. And there's only two of us. I have another question for you. Yeah. Because, I mean, if you're in retail business or if you're somebody that carries stock, uh, you know, that's your dollars sitting on the yeah. shelf. Uh, what kind of an impact did you make for your first client in their profitability? over time with having that program? Well, it allowed them to take people away from having to do manual processes. Uh, at one point, they were placing orders, and the, uh, the way it worked was the manager would go in, and he'd type in, he'd go walk the store, figure out what he needed to order, type all that stuff in, pick up the phone or fax, send that information in, and then when it came in, he had to retype it all back in, and we were really able to 
you know, somebody else had to take a whole day to do that. We automated the process, and the first thing he does, because he would stay till like 10 o'clock on Tuesday nights, he, I showed him the interface. He picks up the phone. I said, what are you doing? So I go and call to say. So he picks up the phone, calls his wife, and he says, honey, what are you doing tomorrow night? Which was Tuesday night. He says, she says, uh, eating dinner? And he says, well, I'm going to be home. So it made, it saved him four hours every week. It took another 12 hours of staff time. So when they look at it that way, they said, now we can use it elsewhere. What kind of issues or problems did you run into with technical support for your software? For us providing technical support? Yes. Uh, initially, it was not having the internet. The internet has changed our business. You, not a little, tremendous amount. So I go back to the original days, the fastest thing at one time was 1,200 baud modems. And there was no looking, that somebody would say, well, I've got an issue on our computer. And you'd have to work through it and work through it. It took hours to figure out what the issue was. Uh, from the technical support side, being able, we can basically hook up to anybody's computer that we have the software on. And we built, we're using our own product our own service and things. So uh, the biggest issue on technical support is still probably finding out what somebody did. They just say, well, I hit a button. Like, okay, I've got 754 screens. Which screen? I don't know. So it's things like that. John, as you look to the future, uh, what are your goals? Sharon certainly talked about keeping goals in front of you. And, and what are your challenge, uh, biggest challenges in re reaching those? Are they access to capital? Are they finding the right talent? What what are they? Finding talent is an issue today. Programmers have not experienced really a down, down decrease in employment. It actually has gone the opposite. If you want a pure programmer, you can probably make the excellent dollars. Finding programmers who want to come to Madisonville, Kentucky, has been an issue all along. We've had programmers who've grown up in Madisonville, programmers who've moved to Madisonville because of spouses, programmers that have moved here because a friend that worked for us. They all change, things change. Uh, we used to call ourselves a good place for techie people to come in, work for two years, and go on to the big city, which many have done. Uh, so retain people and understanding that there are better ways to do it. Uh, getting Europe, Eastern Europeans to write your code, we researched, and that's not the way to do it. There are other ways, and we continue to explore that. Right now, Jim and I write all the code. Um, that's probably the one biggest thing. The uh, access to capital, sure, but what would I do with it? I'd spend it uh, on probably more people. Uh, the things that we've done I feel right are we've invested a lot of time into documentation within the product. The product documents probably 2,000 pages probably now. So a lot of it's been with that. Right, from the software point of it, how are you protecting that software now that you've gotten to a certain place? Have you got it patented or you got it licensed or, or how did you protect that software the code that you've done? Sure. Uh, software, as soon as you write it and put it onto a disk, is copyrighted. Oh, cool. Today's rules are that. It used to be we would do a copyright about once a year, package all of the first 125 pages up, send it off to the copyright office, and you have to do it that way. The rules have changed. You could do a patent on it, but there's nothing I've seen within our product that is unique unless you look at the entire product and it's so huge it'd be hard to patent. The problem with patents, though, even if you did, is you have to go and find who's violating your patent. And then you need lawyers to go after those people. So it becomes quite expensive uh, to maintain a patent, especially in the software world. Um, talk to Apple and uh, Microsoft about patents and how many millions they've spent. So that's copyrights by the closest. And we keep changing. Yeah. Uh, one of the biggest things about being a small company in the software world is we can make changes today 
that at the corporate level, which our competitors want to We can make a decision today and implement it this afternoon and have it out to our, our customers tomorrow. They're still back trying to figure out that they gotta have a meeting. So <laughs> that's been our advantage, we can move so damn fast. Um, the requirements with those, with our vendors, the, the two hardware co-ops, that they come back with new specifications and say, you guys have to be doing this. And most of the time, we will come back and, and be done in, in, in 30 to 60 days with those specs. I'd just like to ask you, what makes you happiest about your business? I mean, what makes you still excited about being in your I'll business? Oh, I go to work. Because I get to make cool stuff happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I like it when a customer calls it, or I talk to a customer, and they, but our ideas come from our customers, uh, probably 90%. And they may not realize it, because we may take one from you, one from you, one from you, and we merge them into something totally different. You say, well, I need it to do so-and-so. And you want it to do, well, I want it to do so-and-so, and you put a twist on what she's done. He twisted it even further. So we have to come up with a way to wrap this whole thing around. And that's just cool. Um, and be able to come back and say, hey, we did this for you. And they go, that's cool. You hit it on the head. Um, but other thing we've done is going to customers. We've gotten rid of customers. Back in the 2000 time period, we systematically went through all our customers and said we're going to keep, keep, gone, 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 gone. And we wrote, and we did not just say you're gone. We found another company in town at the time, partnered with them, and said, we're going to be sending new hardware customers. Do you want them? And they said yes. And we wrote letters to those folks, phone calls to those folks, and, and introduced them and that was probably the other best thing we ever did. That was the narrow not focus. Narrow, narrow, <coughs> but didn't just drop them, right. gave them a path. So this is how you're going to succeed. So, yeah. Today's mobile market, and mm -hmm. your system is mobile friendly to where those owners of those hardware stores can access the store from their mobile devices or their uh, tablets. The best answer I've got is we've got a blind store owner and he checks his condition of the store on his phone. And it, it gets sent to him. He doesn't even have to ask for it, it just comes. So, yeah, mobile is definitely something we look at. We're not responsible. <laughs> Any other questions? One more. If you had to give one short lesson learned to a new person going into business, maybe it's your business, maybe it's something completely different, what kernel would you give them? If you want one. <laughs> one. <laughs> one. Probably the best thing we've done, and what we have seen, as we look, we've seen lots of businesses. We're not dealing with individuals, we're dealing with businesses. And we see books from one end to the other. It is, you need to run it as a big corporation. And mean that just because the money is in the checking account doesn't mean it's yours. And that's probably the biggest one I've seen and the most dangerous. And pay your taxes. I don't care, don't pay yourself, make sure you pay the taxes. <laughs> Because more people, we had one competitor who decided that he didn't have the funds, the only reason we can figure it, he didn't pay his FWT, or FWT, yeah. And federal withholding folks came in and said, you owe a million dollars. So that guy most likely is going to jail. They're just not writing a check. So the last
you have a business or you know someone, send them there. Uh, ask them if there's an entry because as we're growing, you know, we want to find new businesses and interesting businesses you guys can continue to learn from and, um, and network with. And yes. follow us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. Check us out. Help us out. Help us grow. Bring a friend next week. Have coffee. Come this coffee. And <laughs> then it, it, have a good time. Uh, I appreciate y'all being here. Um, we've got to be on time, so we're adjourned. <laughs> 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 <laughs>